Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had powerful bloodline of Percy Jackson and had all god power? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video. The Friday before winter break, my mom packed me an overnight bag and a few deadly weapons. And took me to a new boarding school, we picked up my best friends Annabeth and Talia on the way. Talia wiped the fog off the car window and peered outside, oh yeah, this'll be fun. Westover Hall looked like an evil knight's castle, it was all black stone, with tower and slit windows and a big set of wooden double doors. It was a snowy cliff overlooking this big frosty forest on one side and the churning over ocean on the other. Naruto's pav I looked out to the school-like castle. I let out a low whistle, that sure is big, I exclaimed. I saw some kids get out of a car from down below. I left and went to a burger parlor. When I woke up a few days ago in Maine, near the coast, I checked around for what year, month, and day it was. I noticed I looked about 16 years old. I had been tracking down two half-bloods that were inside Westover. They were brother and sister. Hum, must be great to have siblings. I ordered a burger, some fries, and a coke. It took longer than it should have. The waitress wouldn't stop blushing at me and stuttering. I've been having that effect on girls lately. After I had eaten my food, in the distance, I noticed some movements about a kilometer away from Westover Hall in the woods. I pumped some chakra into my eyes to see better. I saw, the hunters. I cursed under my breath. There must have been a powerful monster at Westover to attract the hunters. Now to get to Westover Hall and see what the hunters are, well, hunting. Okay off to, you didn't pay for your bill, sir, the waitress said still sporting a blush. I cursed under my breath and dug into my pockets for some money. I handed her the money and said with a large smile, here you go, she just blushed and nodded. Now off to, I was cut off again by the waitress. Um, here's your change, she said and ran off with a blush after she handed it to me. Hum, two dollars and fifty cents in change and, a note, a note with her number. I looked up at the sky and said, you all are laughing at me right now I bet, with that said, I left. Percy's pav I could feel the teacher's eyes on my back, but I walked closely to Talia. We walked silently not wanting to blow our cover. As soon as we passed through the doors of the gym Grover turned to us. That was close, Grover said, thank the gods you made it. We said, hi, back to him, so what's the emergency, I asked. Grover took a deep breath. I found two. This made our eyes go wide. Finding one half blood was rare enough. This year, Chiron had put the stay RS on double time, overdrive overtime and sent them all over the country scouring schools from fourth grade to twelfth grade grover continued his explanation a brother and a sister he said they're ten and twelve i don't know their parentage but they're strong we're running out of time though and he is going to snag them soon talia asked the foreboding question monsters grover sighed and scratched his hair you just met him dr thorne grover looked at talia desperately i tried not to feel upset by that used to be Grover looked at me for answers, but Talia had seniority. Not just because her dad was Zeus. Talia had more experience than any of us with ending off monsters in the real world. Right, she said. These half bloods are at the dance, right? Grover nodded. Then let's dance, Talia said. Annabeth smiled. I looked at her. What? Annabeth looked at me with a glimmer in her eyes. Nothing. It's just good to have Talia back. As we walked through the gym, Grover pointed them out. There they are. Grover nodded toward a couple of younger kids arguing in the bleachers. Bianca and Nico D'Angelo. The girl wore a floppy green cap, like she was trying to hide her face. The boy was obviously her little brother. They both had dark silky hair and olive skin, and they used their hands a lot as they talked. The boy was shuffling some kind of trading cards. His sister seemed to be scolding him about something. She kept looking around as if she was uneasy as if she knew something was going to happen. Annabeth said, do they, I mean, have you told them? Grover shook his head. You know how it is. That could put them in more danger, once they realize who they are, their scent becomes stronger. As if on K, Dr. Thorne came out and looked at us. Immediately Talia told us to act natural and dance or something. 
I was lucky enough to get partnered with Annabeth to dance and we had a nice long chat about her school and her parents moving. It made me a bit down to not see her a lot but it was cool because she was happy. I looked around casually to the benches and my eyes widened. Darn, I whispered to Annabeth, they're gone. Annabeth looked at he bleachers and sure enough the two had disappeared. I looked around frantically for Dr. Thorne and he wasn't there either. Darn. Annabeth ran up to find Talia but I knew there wasn't time. I ran to the exit. The door led into a dark hallway. I heard the sounds of scuffling up ahead, then a painful grunt. I uncapped Riptide. The pen grew in my hands until I held a bronze Greek sword about three feet long with a leather bound grip. The blade glowed faintly, casting a golden light on the rows of lockers. I jogged down the corridor, but when I got to the other end, no one was there. I opened the door and found myself in the main entry hall. I looked around and saw the D'Angelo kids. They stood in fear staring at me. I advanced slowly lowering the tip of my sword. I held out a hand, it's okay, I'm not going to hurt you. I tried to call out again then suddenly whiish, I felt something stab my shoulder and I felt pain explode. I gasped and fell to my knees. I turned around quickly, sweeping my sword only to hit air. Perseus Jackson, Dr. Thorne said. His accent severely hampered my ability to understand him. Thank you for coming out of the gym, I hate middle school dances. I didn't know what kind of monster Dr. Thorne was, but he was fast. I tried to contact Grover but it was having no affect. We walked for a long time through the words. We'd reached a cliff overlooking the sea. I could sense the sea was down there, I could smell the cold salty froth. But all I could see was mist and darkness. Dr. Thorne pushed us toward the edge. I stumbled and Bianca caught me. Thanks, I murmured. What is he? She whispered. How do we fight him? I, I'm working on it. I grunted back. The other D'Angelo sniffled while fiddling with some little metal soldier of some kind. Thorne's two tone eyes glittered hungrily. He pulled something from under his coat. At first I thought it was a switchblade, but it was only a phone. He pressed the button and said, The package, it is ready to deliver. I glanced behind me wondering how far the drop was. Dr. Thorne laughed. By all means, son of Poseidon, jump. There is the sea. Save yourself. What did he call you? Bianca muttered. I'll explain later, I said. Grover, I thought desperately. Come to me, a few minutes passed by and Dr. Thorne started to gloat about some kind of general and the great stirring. Bianca muttered this guy was completely nuts. Just then as I thought I had to jump Annabeth did a spectacular move. Wearing her cap of invisibility she pushed all the D'Angelos and me to the ground. Dr. Thorne was snapped out of his gloating and looked at us with surprise. Thorne sent a volley of missiles and because of my quick thinking I was able to take out my shield which Tyson, my cyclops brother, made for me. It blocked most of the thorns but it made my left hand go numb. The shield however was in far worse condition. It was dented everywhere and wouldn't hold up another attack. Talia then decided it was a good idea to join the fight. Talia wielding her magic shield Aegis charged at Dr. Thorne. Dr. Thorne roared and began to change. He grew larger until he was in his true form. His face was still human, but his body that of a huge lion. His leathery, spiky tail whipped deadly thorns in all directions. A manticore, Annabeth said, now visible. Her magical New York Yankees cap had come off when she'd plowed into us. Who are you people? Bianca D'Angelo demanded. I just yelled back trying to get up, later, fight now. I rolled to the left to dodge a volley of thorns and Annabeth pushed the D'Angelos down. Talia was handling her own moving quickly but I knew it wasn't enough. Thorn sent another volley of his spikes at us and all of a sudden silvery arrows shot to intercept them each, perfectly. No one, not even Apollo's kids at camp, could shoot with that much accuracy. The manticore growled as he heard the call of the horn, a hunting horn. Then archers came out from the woods. They were girls, about a dozen of them. The youngest was maybe ten. The oldest, about fourteen, like me. They wore silvery ski parkas and jeans, and they were all armed with bows. They advanced on the manticore with determined expressions. The hunters. Annabeth cried. Next to me, Talia muttered, oh, wonderful. I didn't have a chance to ask what she meant. One of the older archers stepped forward with her bow drawn. She was tall and graceful with coppery-colored skin. 
Unlike the other girls, she had a silver circlet braided into the top of her long dark hair, so she looked like some kind of Persian princess. Permission to kill my lady? I couldn't tell who she was talking to, because she kept her eyes on the manticore. The monster wailed. This is not fair, direct interference, it is against the ancient laws. Not so, another girl said. This one was a little younger than me maybe twelve or thirteen. She had auburn hair gathered back in a ponytail and strange eyes, silvery yellow like the moon. Her face was so beautiful it made me catch my breath. But her expression was stern and dangerous. The hunting of all wild beasts is within my sphere. And you, foul creature, are a wild beast. Permission granted Zoe. The manticore growled. If I cannot have these alive, I shall have them dead. The manticore lunged at me then we heard a shout. Dynamic entry. The manticore stopped dead in its tracks. We all looked around from where the voice came from, including the hunters. A guy wearing an Abercrombie and Fitch jacket with his hood on, blue jeans, and black converses came up from above and did some kind of kick to the manticore that sent it flying off the cliff. The hunters looked a little annoyed that someone had just taken their kill, but it's understandable. He waved to the hunters and said, Nice to see you girls again. The hunters must have somehow recognized him, because, as soon as he spoke, they didn't seem as mad. Some of them just nodded their heads to him. A good majority waved back to him with a smile on their faces, this included the girl named Zoe and the red haired girl. He turned and walked towards us Annabeth, Talia, Grover, and me. Hey, Grover, Annabeth, and Talia, it has been a while, he shouted at the three of them. I felt kind of mad that he left me out, but apparently he knew the three. Who are you? Do we know you? Talia asked while Annabeth and Grover nodded. The guy laughed. Don't you remember? Oh, I better take off this hood so you can see me better. The guy took off his hood revealing a guy with spiky blonde hair with two locks of hair on either side of his face. He also has three faint whisker marks on each sides of his face. He had blue eyes and a large smile on his face. Grover, Talia, and Annabeth all gasped when they saw who he was. He smirked when he saw the astonished looks on their faces. Well, do you remember who I am, or what? I looked over to Talia, Grover, and Annabeth and they looked like they were about to cry. The guy walked over to Annabeth. He was about six feet zero and he towered over Annabeth. She jumped up into his arms and gave him a hug while crying silently. After a while she let go and he gave her a heartwarming smile and went to Grover. He stopped eye front of Grover, who, at this point, had a big smile on his face and looked like he found a long lost puppy. The guy gave Grover a one-armed guy hug and patted Grover on the back. Grover winced a bit from the pats, because the guy looked pretty strong and was a lot taller than Grover. The guy pulled away from the hug and patted Grover a few more times on the shoulder then went to Talia. When he got to Talia, I noticed she was looking down at the ground while her shoulder was shaking, she looked like she was sobbing. When the guy stopped walking, he was about arm's length away from her. Talia, he said softly. She looked up and her eyes were red from crying. She said one thing before jumping into his arms, Naruto. After a couple of turned events, a few things can explain the scene I am looking at. I see Percy being led to my mother's, Artemis, tent by Zoe, Grover and Annabeth being asked questions by Nico, the hunters in their tents that they made in a matter of minutes, and Talia pacing in the snow. I pondered on what I should do. I could go to my mom's tent but then I'd most likely have to listen to my mother talk about, young maidens, and about them going, astray, and I am not going to listen to that. I could also go to Grover and Annabeth and help them with Nico, but then I would have to answer lots of questions. Nico kind of reminds me of, well, me, when I was a kid. Loud, curious, and slightly obnoxious, reminds me of the good old days. I could go and talk to the hunters and stuff, but they still don't like me that much so I will stay away from them for now. Sigh, I guess that means I will have to go and talk to Talia and I was hoping I could talk to her in a better place. I walked over to Talia, who was still pacing around, and I had to admit to myself that I was sort of scared. I have defeated more monsters than I could count, and I can count pretty high, but you know the old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I cursed lightly to myself when I noticed I was well in speaking range of Talia. And I didn't think of anything to say, uh, hey. Talia, I say meekly. Yeah, what is it Naruto? Talia asked, apparently a bit ticked off. 
Well, what has gotten you so mad? You usually never get this mad unless I say something stupid, and I haven't said anything stupid yet, I joked. She cracked a slight smile, but then went back to frowning, she said, it's that good for nothing Zoe, she's just so so so. Obnoxious? I piped in. She glared at me and said, I don't need your crap right now, Naruto, you're not helping. I sighed. Look, Talia, I know it's hard to get along with Zoe, but with her past and all, well, you can't really blame her reasoning? She glared at me some more, so, are you saying you agree with her? Uh, no, no, it's not like that it's, just, well, you know, I said. Just stop, Naruto. I know you're trying to help, but you're really bad at it, Talia said, clearly annoyed. Uh, I'll just be leaving now, so I don't say something that I will definitely regret later, I said. Just as I finished talking, Percy came out of my mother's tent. Talia, Grover, and Annabeth huddled around Percy, most likely they were very anxious to hear what had happened in his audience with the goddess. I sighed in relief that Percy had got finished talking to my mother. I definitely was feeling quite awkward talking to Talia. I haven't seen her in such a long time and I just couldn't figure out what to say or do to comfort her. I walked towards my mother as she stares out to the east, no doubt waiting for her brother and my uncle. Hey, mom. I greeted her. Hello. Naruto, she greeted back with a nod. I took on a serious face, do you know what monster the manticore was talking about? She also got more serious and turned to face me. She stared up at me because since she was in her 12 year old body, and I was a lot taller than she was. Yes, I have, and I must hunt the monster before it is too late, she said. You're not taking the hunters? I asked, slightly surprised she wouldn't be taking the hunters. No. I must hunt this monster alone, she answered. But, wouldn't the saying, strength in numbers apply here nicely? I asked, hoping she would agree with me, she laughed lightly and shook her head. No, Naruto, this monster is far, far too dangerous for the hunters, she said. Then take me with you. You know just how powerful I am. I could help you with just about any monster. I rebutted. I haven't used a big word like, rebutted, in a long time. She was about to say something but hesitated. I could see she was really considering bringing me. She sighed, I do know how strong you are, Naruto, and I know that you would be a good asset to bring to fight the monster. But, I need you to make sure that my hunters and the other half-bloods get to half-blood camp. I sighed. I understand, mom, just, just be careful. You may be a god, but you might get into trouble along the way. Just don't fall into anyone's trap. You're going to be need in the upcoming meeting on the winter solstice. She smiled and nodded. I'll be careful, but you need to be careful also. We both know you get in more trouble than any other half blood in the history of half bloods. We both shared a good laugh. I will. I replied. We both stood there in a comfortable silence. I then felt someone hug me around the upper part of my abdomen. I looked down to see my mother giving me an awkward hug. I smiled and returned it. We hugged in silence briefly before both letting go. We both turned to the east and waited for dawn. I glance at my mother out of the corner of my eye and smile a bit. She was a really great mom sometimes. Percy's paw finally the sky began to lighten. Artemis muttered, about time. He's so oh oh lazy during the winter. You're, um, waiting for sunrise? I asked, for my brother, yes. I knew the legends about Apollo driving a big sun chariot across the sky, but I also knew that the sun was really a star about a zillion miles away. I'd gotten used to some of the Greek myths being true, but still, I didn't see how Apollo could drive the sun. It's not exactly as you think, Artemis said, like she was reading my mind. Okay, okay. I started to relax, so, it's not like he'll be pulling up in a. There was a sudden burst of light on the horizon, a blast of warmth. Don't look, Artemis advised, not until he parks. Parks? I averted my eyes, and saw that the other kids were doing the same, except Naruto, who strangely enough, was wearing some weird sunglasses and grinning like a madman. The light and warmth intensified until my winter coat felt like it was melting off of me, then suddenly the light died. I looked, and I couldn't believe it, it was my car. Well, the car I wanted, anyway. A red convertible Maserati Spider. It was so awesome it glowed. Then I realized it was glowing because the metal was hot. The snow had melted around the Maserati in a perfect circle, 
which explained why I was now standing on green grass and my shoes were wet. The driver got out, smiling. He looked about a year or two older than Naruto, so about 17 or 18, and for a second, I had the uneasy feeling it was Luke, my old enemy. I also noticed he looked a lot like Naruto also. This guy had the same outdoorsy good looks, but not Naruto's rugged and pretty boyish looks. But it wasn't Luke or Naruto. This guy was taller than Luke but a bit shorter than Naruto and with no scar on his face like Luke or the scar like whiskers on his face like Naruto. His smile was brighter and more playful like Naruto's. Luke didn't do much more than scowl and sneer these days. The Maserati driver wore jeans and loafers and a sleeveless t-shirt. Phew, it's really hot, Naruto exclaimed. Naruto took off his jacket, revealing a black muscle shirt that showed that he must have worked out, a lot. How are you doing, Uncle Apollo? Naruto asked. Naruto walked up to Apollo and gave him a one-armed hug. Hey, Naruto, I'm doing alright. Last I heard you were dead, Apollo said. Yeah, well, resurrection and all that good stuff, Naruto replied. Wow, Talia murmured. Apollo and Naruto are hot. Apollo is the sun god, I said. That's not what I meant. Little sister, Apollo called. What's up? You never call. You never write. I was getting worried. Naruto snickered a bit and Artemis sent him a little glare. Artemis sighed. I'm fine, Apollo, and I am not your little sister. Hey, I was born first. Apollo rebutted. We're twins. How many millennia do we have to argue? So what's up? He interrupted. Got the girls with you, I see. You all need some tips on archery. Actually, Uncle Apollo, my mom has to do some hunting to do, alone. We need you to give us and the hunters to camp half-blood. Right, mom? Naruto said. Correct, Naruto. So will you do it, Apollo? Artemis asked. Sure, sis. Then he raised his hands in a stop everything gesture. I feel a haiku coming on. The hunters all groaned. Apparently they'd met Apollo before. He cleared his throat and held up on hand dramatically. Green grass breaks through snow. Artemis pleads for my help. I am so cool. He grinned at us, waiting for applause. That last line was only four syllables, Naruto said. Apollo frowned. Was it? Yes. What about I am so big headed? Artemis suggested. No, no, that's six syllables. Hm, he started muttering to himself. Zoe Nightshade turned to us. Lord Apollo has been going through this haiku phase ever since he visited Japan. Tis not as bad as the time he visited Limerick. If I'd had to hear one more poem that started with, there once was a goddess from Sparta. I've got it, Apollo announced. I am so awesome. That's five syllables, he bowed, looking very pleased with himself. And now, sis. Transportation for the hunters, you say? Good timing, I was just about ready to roll. These demigods will also need a ride, Artemis aid, pointing to us, some of Chiron's campers. No problem. Apollo checked us out. Let's see, Talia, right? I've heard all about you. Talia blushed. Hi, Lord Apollo. Naruto snickered. I'd never thought I'd see the day when Talia would blush. The world must be coming to an end. Talia blushed harder. Shut up, Naruto. Apollo started talking about Talia being his half-sister and a bunch of other nonsense. Brother, Artemis said. You should get going. Oh, right. Then he looked at Naruto. My favorite nephew, Naruto. And your only nephew, Uncle Apollo, from Artemis, Naruto replied. And I never though the day would come, Apollo replied. Then he turned to look at me. Percy Jackson? Yeah, I mean, yes, sir. It seemed weird calling a teenager, sir, but I learned to be careful with immortals. They tended to get offended easily, then they blew stuff up. Apollo studied me, but he didn't say anything, which I found a little creepy. Well, he said at last, we'd better load up, huh? Ride only goes one way, west, and if you miss it, you miss it. I looked at the Maserati, which would seat two people max, there were about twenty of us. Cool car, Nico said. Thanks, kid, Apollo said. But how will we fit? Oh, Apollo seemed to notice the problem for the first time. Well, yeah. I hate to change out of sports car mode, but I suppose. He took out his car keys and beeped the security alarm button. Chirp, chirp. 
For a moment, the car glowed brightly again. When the glare died, the Maserati had been replaced by one of those turtle top shuttle buses like we used for school basketball games. Right, he said. Everybody in. Zoe ordered the hunters to start loading. She picked up her camping pack, and Apollo said, Here, sweetheart. Let me get that. Zoe recoiled. Her eye flashed murderously. Uncle, Naruto chided. You shouldn't do that. You know how hunters are. Also, you do not help my hunters. You do not look at, talk to, or flirt with my hunters. And you do not call them sweetheart, Artemis said. Apollo spread his hands. Sorry, I forgot. Hey, sis, where are you going off to anyway? Hunting, Artemis said, it's none of your business. I'll find out, I see all and know all. Artemis snorted, just drop them off, Apollo, and no messing around. No, no, I never mess around. Artemis rolled her eyes, and then looked at us. I will see you by the winter solstice, Zoe, you are in charge of the hunters. Do well, do as I would do. Zoe straightened. Yes, my lady. Artemis knelt and touched the ground as if looking for tracks. When she rose, she looked troubled. So much danger. The beast must be found. She sprinted toward the woods and melted into the snow and shadows. Apollo turned and grinned jangling the car keys on his finger so he said who wants to drive the hunters piled into the van they all crammed onto the back so they'd be as far away as possible from apollo and the rest of his highly infectious males they don't really hate me considering i am artemis son actually funny story the way my mother and father fell in love and well you know made me is actually really weird my mother got an assignment from zeus to investigate the elemental countries so she went under the disguise as Kashina Uzumaki. Zeus, not wanting anyone to be suspicious of gods and goddesses, took away my mother's powers momentarily and gave her chakra. So she took refuge in the Whirlpool country for a while until it was attacked, due to the Third Great Ninja War. She, and some other Whirlpool refugees, went to Konoha for a place to stay since they had an alliance. Artemis met my dad, Minato, and he fell in love, she kindly turned down his attempts, but he kept coming back. After a while, she fell in love with the guy. Finally, she got pregnant with me. When Zeus heard that Artemis had a child, to say the least, he was furious. When I was born, he just couldn't take it anymore. He sent the Kayubi to Konoha to kill me and my father. When Artemis heard that Zeus sent Kayubi to kill my dad and me, she got very mad. She couldn't do anything though. Her powers were still gone. She knew she couldn't take on the Kayubi in her current state so she was powerless to save me or my father. My dad took me and sealed the Kayubi into me. When my father sealed Kayubi into me, Artemis faked my death so Zeus would leave me alone. Zeus believed it and gave back Artemis her powers. My mom knew she couldn't take me with her knowing that Zeus would figure out he was tricked so she left me. She faked her death as Kashina Uzumaki and left the elemental countries. She was hoping she would never have to see me again. Now, that might sound terrible to you but, a goddess who swore to stay a maiden forever and had a child is sort of embarrassing. I bet you're wondering how in the world I came to the United States in the first place. Well it happened on the mission to get Sasuke back to Konoha when he betrayed us. When Sasuke and I had a collision course with his Chidori, when he had his curse seal on level 2, and my Rasengan, which had the Kyubi's chakra in it, I guess it caused some kind of dimension tear or something and poof. I'm in the United States. I woke up in the United States and I met Talia. Then we went on a crazy adventure and meet Grover, Annabeth, and Luke. We met with my mother and our hunters along the way. Artemis told me who I was and who my parents were. At first I was mad, but I ended up forgiving her. The hunters also, at first, hated me. I changed their minds after a while of talking to them. Now, they have a very mild dislike for me. But, it is a lot better than how they think of other boys. Then, I died again. You see, as we were a little ways away from the camp we were attacked heavily. My mother had told me that Zeus had figured out that I was alive, and he was, I guess you could say, pissed. When we were almost at camp, he sent one of his sons after me. The son he sent after me was Hercules, a minor god. Now, being the outrageously handsome and kind half-blood that I am, I stayed behind to take Hercules down. But, Grover, Talia, Luke, and Annabeth wanted to be stubborn, they wanted to help me. 
After a heartfelt goodbye, they finally left. When I say heartfelt goodbye, I meant lots of tears and Talia telling me I better come back or she would kick me where I wouldn't like it. So they left, me and Hercules had an epic battle, and I was the victor. But not without a price, I died. So I went to the underworld and Hades felt sorry for me, shocker isn't it, and went me to Elysium. While there, I saw some old faces. I saw Haku, Zabuza, another shocker huh, and Jiraiya. Apparently, since I was, dead, the first time, three years had passed in the elemental countries. Haku, Zabuza, and Jiraiya all trained me for a reason I didn't know at that time. After a while, Hades told me I had a chance of resurrection. He told me that if I took the chance of resurrection, I wouldn't be able to do it again. I agreed readily and now here I am. I never did tell you what happened after Talia hugged me huh? Well all I will tell you is that Talia kept her promise and she kicked me in the. Now enough of the flashbacks and what not. Bianca sat with the hunters, leaving her little brother to hand in the front with us, which seemed cold to me, but Nico didn't seem to mind. Apparently Percy seems to agree with me on this one too. This is so cool, Nico said, jumping up and down in the driver's seat. Is this really the sun? I thought Helios and Selene were the sun and moon gods. How come sometimes it's them and sometimes it's you and Artemis? Downsizing, Apollo said. The Romans started it. They couldn't afford all those temple sacrifices, so they laid off Helios and Selene and folded their duties into my mother and uncle's job descriptions. My mother got the moon. Apollo got the sun, I said. It was pretty annoying at first, but at least I got this cool car, Apollo said. But how does it work? Nico asked. I thought the sun was a big fiery ball of gas. Apollo chuckled and ruffles Nico's hair. That rumor probably got started because Artemis used to call me a big fiery ball of gas. Seriously, kid, it depends on whether you're talking about astronomy or philosophy. You want to talk astronomy? Bah, what fun is that? You want to talk about humans think about the sun? Ah, now that's more interesting. They've got a lot riding on the sun, er, so to speak. It keeps them warm, grows their crops, powers engines, and makes everything look, well, sunnier. This chariot is built out of human dreams about the sun, kid. It's as old as Western civilization. Every day, it drives across the sky from east to west, lighting up all those puny little mortal lives. The chariot is a manifestation of the sun's power, the way mortals perceive it. Makes sense. Nico shook his head. No, well then, just think of it as a really powerful, really dangerous solar car. Can I drive? Number two young. Ooh, ooh, Grover raised his hand. Um, no, Apollo said. Too furry. He looked past Percy and focused on Talia. Oh gods. Daughter of Zeus, he said. Lord of the sky perfect oh no talia shook her head no thanks come on apollo said how old are you talia hesitated i don't know it was sad and funny but true she'd been turned into a tree when she was 12 the same time i died and i was 13 but that had been seven years ago so she should be 19 if you went by years but she should be 19 if you went by years and i should be 20 or 21 but she still felt like she was 12, and if you looked at her, she seemed somewhere in between. Apollo tapped his finger to his lips. You're 15, almost 16. How do you know that? Hey, I'm the god of prophecy. I know stuff. You'll turn 16 in about a week. That's my birthday, December 22nd. Hey, what about me, Uncle Apollo? How old am I? Apollo tapped his finger to his lips again. You turned 17 about two months or so ago. Really? Wow, I guess I still have to go to school, and with that happy thought, I sulked. Talia, though, was very happy about my age. That means you're older than me, you can drive instead. I smirked to myself. This was payback for kicking me in my. Now why would I not let the daughter of the almighty Zeus ride the sun chariot? I mean, Zeus does hate me, so you might as well drive, I said, almost giddily. She gave me the most hate-filled glare she could muster, and it promised pain. Talia tried to protest, but Apollo was absolutely not going to take, no, for an answer. Take it away, Apollo told Talia, after getting a sign that said warning, student driver, you're gonna be a natural. Yeah, good luck with that, 
I said getting ready to go to sleep. What are you doing? Percy asked. I smirked at him. I'm gonna go to sleep and I suggest you do the same. Why? Well, you definitely do not want to be awake for this ride, I said, and I went to sleep. Still Naruto's pav yawn. That was a great nap, I looked out my window to see we were in a lake. Smooth, Talia, smooth. Well, said Apollo with a brave smile. You were tight, my dear. You had everything under control. Let's go see if we boiled anyone important, shall we? I knew she would do something like this, I exclaimed. You knew she would crash? And you still let her drive? Percy shouted. Calm down, Percy. If I drove, that would mean I wouldn't get my payback, I replied calmly. Percy must have remembered what Talia did to me because he shuddered as he took in what I said. I guess you're right, he finally said. I nodded. We all got out of the bus to see how bad Talia messed up. Ha 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 ha. Well, Talia, isn't payback eh? Seemed like we're leaving now. Percy's pav I took in the sight of seeing Camp Half Blood in the winter, it looked so different to me. I heard Talia talking to Naruto, or, well, screaming at him for having her drive a car. I sort of felt sorry for him, oh well, I'll get over it. Whoa, Nico said as he climbed off the bus, is that a climbing wall? Yeah, I said. Why is there lava pouring down it? Little extra challenge. Come one. I'll introduce you to Chiron. Zoe, have you met? I know Chiron, Zoe said stiffly. Tell him we will be in cabin 8. Hunters, follow me. Grover was about to say something, but Naruto stopped him and whispered something into his ear. Grover seemed a bit sad at first but then smiled and nodded and left after the hunters. As Bianca D'Angelo was leaving, she leaned over and whispered something in her brother's ear. She looked at him for an answer, but Nico just scowled and turned away. Apollo said his goodbyes to us, which consisted with flirting with the hunters and giving me a warning. Nico was still looking grumpy. I wondered what his sister had told him. Who's Chiron? He asked. I don't have his figurine. Our activities director, I said. He's, well, you'll see. If those hunter girls don't like him, Nico grumbled, that's good enough for me. Let's go. Ouch, harsh. Naruto piped in. Quiet, Naruto. Talia and Annabeth both said, and elbowed him in the gut. We got to the big house and saw Mr. D and Chiron playing a quiet game of cards in the parlor. Chiron smiled when he saw us. Percy, Talia, Annabeth, ah, and this must be. Nico D'Angelo, I said. He and his sister are half bloods. Chiron breathed a sigh of relief. You succeeded, then, who is this? Chiron looked to Naruto, puzzled on who he was. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, Chiron and Lord Dionysus, I shall introduce myself. There was a loud poof of smoke came from where Naruto was. When it cleared, Naruto was on top of a toad the size of a horse and he was doing some ridiculous dance. When he stopped, he said, I am the destructor of evil. I am the slayer of all monsters. Women and girls alike stare at me with lust. Men look at me in envy. Even children and babies stare at me in awe. For I am Naruto Uzumaki, wielder of Kabikari Hucho the decapitating carving knife, and son of Artemis and Minato Namikaze. Silence. Nobody said a word. Naruto bowed to Chiron and Mr. D after his little introduction was done. Well, that sure was entertaining. Mr. D said, and he was, smiling. I shoot to please, Lord Dionysus, Naruto said with a charming smile. Too bad, nobody else was lost, Mr. D said. What do you mean? Talia asked. Who else was lost? Just then, Grover trotted into the room, grinning like crazy. He had a black eye and red lined on his face that looked like a slap mark. The hunters are all moved in. Chiron frowned. The hunters. E.H. I see we have much to talk about. He glanced at Nico. He was about to say something else but noticed Grover and Naruto were talking in hushed voices. So, Grover, did you do what I said? Naruto whispered. Yes. Grover said, grinning wider. How do you think I got these? He said pointing at his face. Was it worth it? Naruto asked. Grover only nodded. He had a thin line of blood coming out of his nose. He must have been thinking perverted thoughts. Naruto and Grover started giggling perversely. Oh, Grover, it is so good that you have decided to follow in my footsteps, 
I will teach you all I know, Naruto said, with a perverse grin on his face. Talia and Annabeth must have noticed what they were talking about because they looked mad. Chiron, sensing their impending doom, chose to save one of them. Grover, perhaps you should take our young friend to the den and show him our orientation film. Okay. Grover all but shouted. Grover grabbed Nico and pulled him into the den to watch the movie. Naruto, noticing how mad Talia and Annabeth were, shouted out to Grover, No, Grover, take me with you, don't leave me here. Now, Naruto, what did you have Grover do? Talia asked in a deadly sweet tone. If you tell the truth, we promise to make it hurt for a shorter amount of time, Annabeth said in a sweet tone. Naruto looked to me for help. I turned away and watched Chiron and Mr. D play their card game. Apparently neither of them wanted to face the two girls' wrath either. Annabeth and Talia pulled a crying Naruto out of the room. We could hear the screams and shouts of pain. Mr. D, Chiron, and I all winced when we heard the screams and shouts. Sorry, Naruto. You know what they say, karma is a. The screams stopped. Talia and Annabeth came back in the room with satisfied grins. I was going to ask what happened to Naruto, but I decided against it. Now, Chiron said to Talia, Annabeth, and me, perhaps you three should sit down and tell us the whole story. When we were done, Chiron smiled and said, it's a good thing nobody was hurt. Chiron turned to Mr. D expecting he would say the same. It's good to know that nobody was hurt. We certainly wouldn't want that, he said, with an unbelievable amount of sarcasm. We are happy to know that Annie Bell wasn't lost. Annabeth, I snapped. She'd gone to camp since she was seven, and still Mr. D pretended not to know her name. Yes, yes, he said, offhandedly. It's like he doesn't care about anyone in this camp. I wanted to strangle Mr. D. It wasn't fair Zeus had sent him here to dry out as a camp director for a hundred years. It was meant to be a punishment for Mr. D's bad behavior on Olympus, but it ended up being a punishment for all of us. I got up from the table. Percy. Chiron and Annabeth both said, their tone was full of warning. In the back of my mind, I knew Mr. D was not somebody to mess with. Even if you were an impulsive ADHD kid like me, he wouldn't give you any slack. But I was so angry I didn't care. You'd be glad to lose a camper, I said, you'd like it if we all disappeared. Mr. D stifled a yawn. You have a point? Yeah, I growled. Just because you were sent here as a punishment doesn't mean you have to be a lazy jerk. This is your civilization, too. Maybe you could try helping us out a little. For a second, there was no sound except the crackle of the fire and Naruto's pained groans from outside. The light reflected in Mr. D's eye, giving him a sinister look. He opened his mouth to say something, probably a curse that would blast me to smithereens, when Nico burst into the room, followed by Grover. So cool, Nico yelled holding his hands out to Chiron. You're, you're a centaur. Chiron gave a nervous smile. Yes, Mr. D'Angelo, if you please. Though, I prefer to stay in human form in this wheelchair for, ah, first encounters. And, whoa, he looked at Mr. D. You're the wind dude? No way. Mr. D turned his eye away from me and gave Nico a look of loathing. The wine dud? Dionysus, right? Oh, wow, I've got your figurine. My figurine. In my game, Mythomagic. And a holofoil card, too. And even though you've only got like 500 attack points and everybody thinks you're the lamest god card, I totally think your powers are sweet. I agree. I would love to be able to make wine at any point of time, or be able to use things that associate with wine, Naruto said, popping out of nowhere. Ah. Mr. D seemed truly perplexed, which probably saved my life. Well, that's gratifying. Percy, Chiron said quickly, you, Talia, Annabeth, and, ah, uh, Naruto go down to the cabins. Inform the campers we'll be playing Capture the Flag tomorrow evening. Capture the flag? I asked, but we don't have enough. It is a tradition, Chiron said. A friendly match whenever the hunters visit. Yeah, Talia muttered. I bet it's real friendly. Naruto smiled at her reassuringly and put a hand on her shoulder. Chiron jerked his head toward Mr. D, who was still frowning as Nico talked about how many defense points all the gods had in his game. Run along now, Chiron told us. Oh, right, Talia said. Come on, Percy, 
Annabeth said. They both hauled me out of the big house before Dionysus could remember that he wanted to kill me. Still Percy's pov. You've already got Ares on your bad side, Annabeth reminded me as we all trudged toward the cabins. You need another immortal enemy? She was right. My first summer as a camper, I'd gotten in a fight with Ares, and now he and all his children wanted to kill me. I didn't need to make Dionysus mad, too. Sorry, I said. I couldn't help it, it's just so unfair. Talia stopped by the armory and looked out across the valley, toward the top of Half Blood Hill. Her pine tree was still there the golden fleece glittering in its lowest branch. The tree's magic still protected the borders of camp, but it no longer used Talia's spirit for power. Percy, everything is unfair, Talia muttered, sometimes I wish. She didn't finish, but her tone was so sad I felt sorry for her. With her ragged black hair and her black punk clothes, an old wool overcoat wrapped around her, she looked like some kind of huge raven, completely out of place in the white landscape. I found out that Luke is lost, she said. I still can hardly believe it, we were all such great friends. Don't think like that, Naruto said. Naruto wrapped an arm around her waist, and he pulled her close to him so that she was facing him. She looked up at him, he was taller than her by at least a foot. Don't worry babe. Everything is gonna get better soon, I promise. And I never go back on my promises, Naruto said, with a reassuring wink. Talia blushed, idiot. She gave him a half-hearted glare and slapped him on his shoulder. I can't say I don't agree with you there, but I'm your idiot, he smiled at her. Talia smiled and gives him a hug, which he gives back. After a minute, Annabeth and I gave an embarrassed cough. Talia and Naruto looked at us, then realized the position they were in, then they broke off with blushes on their faces. Over at the basketball court, a few hunters were shooting hoops. One of them was arguing with a guy from the Ares cabin. The Ares kid had his hand on his sword and the hunter girl looked like she was going to exchange her basketball for a bow and arrow and second. We'll break that up, Talia said, referring to her and Naruto. You and Annabeth circulate the cabins. Tell everybody about capture the flag tomorrow. All right. You should be captain. No, no, she said. You've been at camp longer you do it. Naruto sighed exasperatedly, why don't you both do it? She looked about as comfortable with that as I felt, but she nodded. As she and Naruto headed for the court, I said, Hey, Talia. Yeah, I'm sorry about what happened at Westover, I should have waited for you guys. S okay, Percy. I probably would have won the same thing. She shifted from foot to foot, like she was trying to decide whether or not to say more. You know, you asked about my mom and I kind of snapped at you. It's just, I went back to find her after seven years and I found out she died in Los Angeles. She, M, she was a heavy drinker, and apparently she was out driving late one night about two years ago, and, Talia blinked hard. Naruto put an arm around her waist, with worry written all over his face. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it's, it's not like we were ever close. I ran away when I was ten. Best two years of my life were when I was running around with Luke, Naruto, and Annabeth. But still. That's why you had trouble with the sunban. Annabeth elbowed me, as if telling me not to go there. I ignored her. She gave me a confused look. What do you mean? Naruto started backing away slowly. It was as if he knew something that I didn't. The way you stiffened up. You must have been thinking about your mom, not wanting to get behind the wheel. I was sorry I said anything. Talia's expression was dangerously close to Zeus's, the one time I'd seen him angry, like any minute her eyes would shoot a million volts. Yeah, she muttered. Yeah, that must have been it. She trudged off toward the court, where the Ares camper and the hunter were trying to kill each other with a sword and basketball. Don't worry, Percy. Naruto said. He looked at me with a reassuring smile. She's just a little upset, it's nothing I can't fix. Naruto then went off, trying to catch up with Talia. Naruto's pav wow. Talia is pretty upset. After we had broken up the Ares kid and hunter from their fight, and by broken up I mean she yelled at them and release a heavy amount of killing intent, she stormed off to her cabin. Ah, yes. I remember teaching her killing intent, worst idea I ever had. Although, if I didn't, I would have gotten hurt. It was mostly a bad idea because she is a daughter of Zeus. And killing intent, along with a child of one of the big three, is a seriously bad thing. But in my defense, I didn't know back then 
Anyways, I ran after her. Talia, wait up. What, Naruto? She asked angrily, still emitting killing intent in waves. You have to calm down, I said. I don't need to calm down, she shouted at me. She stormed off again to her cabin and went inside. I went after her and grabbed her wrist to make her stop. She tried getting free but I had an iron-like grip. Let go of me, Naruto. She gritted out angrily. No, not until you calm down, I said calmly. I am calm, she said. I knew she was lying. No, you aren't. I pulled her over to one of the beds and I sat down and made her sit down on my lap. Now, tell me what's the matter? I asked. She blushed with embarrassment and anger. I told you, it's nothing. And I know you are lying. Come on, Talia, it's not like I'm gonna judge you or anything, I said, trying to get her to talk. She sighed angrily. Fine, fine, the reason I'm mad is because of what Percy said. Also, I'm still mad about Luke. I winced when she talked about Luke. When we were younger, she was in love with him. I never liked it that much, mostly because I had a crush on Talia. After a while, she started liking me a bit more too. So I though I had a chance. Maybe I don't anymore. Maybe she still likes Luke. Oh, crap. This is starting to be a bit like with Sasuke and Sakura. I had a crush on Sakura, but she liked Sasuke. I had a crush on Talia, but she liked Luke. My life sucks sometimes. Look, Talia. Percy might have not been completely right on what he said. Can you blame him though? You hardly let anyone know about you, so he came to the first conclusion he thought of. About Luke. I knew Luke for about the same amount of time you did. He was a great guy. I doubt he is completely lost. He might still have a chance on becoming good again. Don't lose hope. Talia was quiet. I lifted her off of my lap and set her on the bed. She looked too deep in thought to have noticed. I sighed and left her cabin. I wish she wouldn't worry so much about Luke. I also wish crushes didn't hurt so much. Well, I guess that's why they call it crushes. You usually get crushed. Percy's pov I was pretty miserable at dinner that night. I mean, the food was excellent as usual. You can't go wrong with barbecue, pizza, and never empty soda goblets. The torches and braziers kept the outdoor pavilion warm, but we all had to sit with our cabin mates, which meant I was alone at the Poseidon table. Talia sat alone at the Zeus table, but we couldn't sit together. Camp rules. At least the Hephaestus, Ares, and Hermes cabins had a few people each. Nico sat with the Stoll brothers seemed to be trying to convince Nico that poker was a much better game than Mythomagic. I hoped Nico didn't have any money to lose. Annabeth was by herself at the Athena table looking bored. The only table that really seemed to be having a good time was the Artemis table. The hunters drank and ate and laughed like one big happy family. Naruto sat at the head of the table like he was the father. Zoe sat to his right like she was the mama. She didn't laugh as much as the others, but she did smile from time to time. Naruto was cracking jokes, and making all of the girls laugh, including Zoe. Her silver lieutenant's band glittered in the dark braids of her hair. I though she looked a lot nice when she smiled. Bianca D'Angelo seemed to be having a great time. She was trying to learn how to arm wrestle from the big girl who'd picked a fight with the Ares kid on the basketball court. The bigger girl was beating her every time, but Bianca didn't seem to mind. When we'd finished eating, Chiron made the customary toast to the gods and formally welcomed the hunters of Artemis. The clapping was pretty half-hearted. Then he announced the Goodwill capture the flag game for tomorrow night, which got a lot better reception. Afterward, we all trailed back to our cabins for an early winter lights out. Naruto's pov after dinner the hunters and I went to our cabin. I was still kind of sulking about Talia still liking Luke. I'll get over it eventually. The hunters were really enjoying themselves at dinner. Like a big happy family. I joined in, of course, but it was really half-heartedly. I was pretty exhausted, which meant I fell asleep easily. That was good. What was bad was, I had a nightmare, and it was pretty big. Naruto's dream paw of Artemis was on a dark hillside, shrouded in fog. It almost seemed like the underworld, because I immediately felt claustrophobic and I couldn't see the sky above. Just a close, heavy darkness, as if I were in a cave. Artemis walked up the hill wearily. Old broken Greek columns of black marble were scattered around, as though something had blasted a huge building to ruins. She scrambled over a section of broken wall and came to the crest of the hill. 
She narrowed her eyes. There was a big creature. And he looked like he was in pain. He was on the rocky ground, trying to rise. The blackness seemed to be thicker around him, fog swirling hungrily. His clothing was in tatters and his face drenched with sweat. He looked at Artemis and muttered some things in ancient Greek. His eyes glowed strangely. Artemis looked at him in the eyes and then her silvery eyes glazed over. You will take my burden from me, his metallic-like voice said. She nodded and went towards him. I tried calling out to her. Stop it, get out of his control. But my voice didn't work. I knew by now, this wasn't a dream, it was really happening. Artemis took the darkness from the giant and stopped it from collapsing. The giant walked away and started chuckling. The plan is coming together. I have the goddess of the hunt under my control. This makes things much, much easier. I heard his metallic voice chuckling go into full-blown laughter as he left Artemis. The ceiling of darkness began to crumble again, pushing Artemis against the ground. Naruto's normal pav I sat bolt uptight in bed, clawing at the sheets. Zoe was next to me, in her night clothes. I wonder how she got to me so quickly. Naruto, what is wrong? she asked. I just shook my head, I had a bad dream, you won't like the sound of it, she looked worriedly at me. What happened in your dream? I sighed, this isn't going to go well. Zoe was silent. I had just gotten done telling her my dream and my ideas on it. So, what do you think? I asked. She bolted off my bed and said in a harsh whisper, what do I think? What do I think? I think we need to get out of this camp and we need to save Lady Artemis. She kept going on but I couldn't understand what she was saying. I never took the time to understand her old-fashioned language, by now she was yelling and all of the hunters were trying to calm her down and ask what happened. She calmed down a bit, but I knew she was still mad. I need to speak to Chiron so that we can leave, she said. She made her way out of the cabin but I grabbed her arm and stopped her. I turned her around to face me and grabbed her shoulders. Zoe, you can't do that. Chiron will say no Artemis gave orders to stay here. We have to wait till she says so, I said. How can we wait for her orders when she is under control? Zoe says furiously. Crap. All of the hunters gasped. Now they know. I was hoping of keeping this secret. What do you mean? How is Artemis under control? One of the girls asked. I sighed. I retold my story to the hunters and they weren't happy about it at all. You guys have to realize, we can't go and ask for permission to go and help Artemis, I said. How can you not want to help Lady Artemis, Naruto? She is your mother, Zoe said. That hurt. I want to help her, more than anything in the world, I want to help my mom. But I can't, I can't, and won't, go against my mother's wishes. You know I want to save her, she gave us orders, we can't go against them, I shouted. Zoe sighed. I guess we have no choice. She nodded at someone behind me. I turned to look at them but I felt hit my neck. Then all I saw was black. Percy's paw of the next morning after breakfast, I told Grover about my dream. I had a dream about Annabeth being controlled by something. We sat in the meadow watching the satyrs chase the wood nymphs through the snow. The nymphs had promised to kiss the satyrs if they got caught, but they hardly did. Usually the nymph would let the satyr get up a full head of steam. Then she'd turn into a snow-covered tree and the poor satyr would slam into it headfirst and get a pile of snow dumped on him. When I told Grover my nightmare, he started twirling his finger on his shaggy leg fur. A cave ceiling collapsed on her, he asked. Yeah, what the heck does that mean? Grover shook his head. I don't know, but after what Naruto dreamed. Whoa, what do you mean? Naruto had a dream like that. I, I don't know exactly. About three in the morning Zoe came to the big house and demanded to talk to Chiron, she looked really panicked. Wait, how do you know this? Grover blushed. I was sort of camped outside the Artemis cabin. What for? Just to be, you know, near them. Well, well, well. You're a stalker with hooves, Grover. A voice said from behind us. We turned around and saw Naruto standing there with a smirk. Grover blushed even harder. I am not. I followed her to the big house and hid in a bush and watched the whole thing. She got real upset when argues wouldn't let her in. It was a kind of dangerous scene. What did she say? I asked. Naruto seemed to already know the story because he seemed uninterested. Though for some reason I felt like he was still listening to us. 
Grover grimaced. Well, she starts talking really old fashioned when she gets upset, so it was kind of hard to understand, but something about Artemis being in trouble and need the hunters. And then she called Argus a boiled brained lout, I think that's a bad thing, and that he called her. Whoa, wait. How could Artemis be in trouble? Just because she is a god, doesn't mean they're the strongest things. Naruto said off handedly. Aye, well, finally Chiron came out in his pajamas and his horsetail in curlers. He wears curler in his tail. Silence already, stop interrupting, Naruto said, annoyed. Sorry, I said. Go on. Well, Zoe said she needed permission to leave camp immediately. Chiron refused. He reminded Zoe that the hunters were supposed to stay her until they received orders from Artemis, and she said, Grover gulped. Naruto stopped Grover from saying any more. She said, How are we to get orders from Artemis if Artemis isn't Artemis anymore? What do you mean she isn't herself anymore? Like she has amnesia. Gods, you're a moron. Isn't herself anymore as in controlled. Taken over. Hostage. Controlled? I tried to get my mind around that idea. How would you control an immortal goddess? Is that even possible? Yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened, Naruto said. Who could kidnap her, and why? I asked. I don't know, but someone, or something, very powerful, Naruto replied. I started thinking about Naruto's nightmare, which he had only a few hours after mine. Naruto about your dream, I started off, um, before you guys do, Grover took something out of his coat pocket. It was a three-fold display like a travel brochure. You remember what you said, about how it was weird the hunters just happened to show up at Westover Hall. I think they might have been scouting us. Scouting us? What do you mean? He gave me the brochure. It was basically to convince girls to join them, nothing special. I found that in Annabeth's backpack, Grover said. You checked her backpack? Speaking of Annabeth, where is she? Naruto asked. Grover and I shrugged. Naruto sighed and went off to find her. I don't understand. Well, it seems to me, maybe Annabeth was thinking about joining. Naruto came running back with a worried etched all over his face. Percy, Grover, Annabeth is gone. It looks like she was kidnapped, Naruto said. Percy's pov I'd like to say that I took the news well. The truth was, I wanted to strangle the hunters of Artemis one eternal maiden at a time. I also wanted to go out and search for Annabeth. Naruto made me and Grover promise not to talk about it. He said he would talk to Chiron and Mr. D about it. Not like they'd allow us to do anything. He also said he would tell the hunters and Talia about it also. The rest of the day I tried to keep busy, but I was worried sick about Annabeth. I went to javelin throwing class, but the Ares campers in charge chewed me out after I got distracted and threw the javelin at the target before he got out of the way. I apologized for the hole in his pants, but he still sent me packing. I visited the Pegasus stables, but Selena Beauregard from the Aphrodite cabin was having an argument with one of the hunters and I decided I'd better not get involved. After that, I sat in the empty chariot stands and sulked. Down at the archery fields, Chiron was conducting target practice. I knew he'd be the best person to talk to. Maybe he could give me some advice, but something held me back. I had a feeling Chiron would try to protect me, like he always did. He might not tell me everything he knew. I looked the other direction. At the top of Half Blood Hill, Mr. D and Argus were feeding the baby dragon that guarded the Golden Fleece. Then it occurred to me, no one would be in the big house, there was someone else, something else that I could ask for guidance. I ran past Talia and Naruto. Naruto was being not too subtle at flirting with Talia. Though she didn't pay him any mind, she must have thought he was only being nice to her when he was actually meaning everything he said. My blood was humming in my ears as I ran into the house and took the stairs. I'd only done this once before and I still had nightmares about it. I opened the trap door and stepped into the attic. The room was dark and dusty and cluttered with junk, just like I remembered. There were shields with monster bites out of them, and swords bent in the shapes of demon heads, and a bunch of taxidermy, like a stuffed harpy and a bright orange python. Over by the window, sitting on a three-legged stool, was the shriveled up mummy of an old lady in a tie-dyed hippie dress, the oracle. I made myself walk toward her. I waited for green mist to billow from the mummy's mouth, like it had done before, but nothing happened. Hi, I said. Uh, what's up? I winced at how stupid that sounded. Not much could be. Up. 
when you're dead and stuck in the attic. But I knew the spirit of the oracle was in there somewhere. I could feel a cold presence in the room, like a coiled sleeping snake. I have a question, I said a little louder. I need to know about Annabeth. How can I save her? No answer. The sun slanted through the dirty attic window, lighting the dust motes dancing in the air. I waited longer. Then I got angry. I was being ignored by a stupid corpse. All right, I said. Fine, I'll figure it out myself. I turned and bumped into a big table full of souvenirs. It seemed more cluttered than the last time I was here. Heroes stored all kinds of stuff in the attic. Quest trophies they no longer wanted to keep in their cabins, or stuff that held painful memories. I knew Luke had stored a dragon claw somewhere up here, the one that had scarred his face. There was a broken sword hilt labeled. This broke and Leroy got killed. 1999. Then I noticed a pink silk scarf with a label attached to it. I picked up the tag and tried to read it. Scarf of the Goddess Aphrodite recovered at Waterland, Denver, Colorado. By Annabeth Chase and Percy Jackson I stare at the scarf. I'd totally forgotten about it. Two years ago, Annabeth had ripped this scarf out of my hands and said something like, Oh, no no love magic for you. I'd just assumed she'd thrown it away, and yet here it was. She'd kept it all this time, and why had she stashed it in the attic? I turned to the mummy. She hadn't moved, but the shadows across her face made it look like she was smiling gruesomely. I dropped the scarf and tried not to run toward the exit. Percy's paw of that night after dinner, I was seriously ready to bead the hunters at capture the flag. It was going to be a small game. Naruto and only 13 hunters, including Bianca D'Angelo, and about the same number of campers. Zoe Nightshade looked pretty upset. She kept glancing resentfully at Chiron and Naruto, like she couldn't believe he was making her do this. The other hunters didn't look too happy either. Unlike last night, they weren't laughing or joking around. They just huddled together in the dining pavilion, whispering nervously to each other as they strapped on their armor. Some of them even looked like they'd been crying. I guess Naruto had told them about his nightmare. Naruto was by himself putting finishing touches to his own personal armor. He looked like a god. He was wearing heavy plate body armor without a helmet. He was shining his gigantic sword. Its name was Kabikari Hucho. The sword was like six feet long and at least one foot wide. The sword was scarier than Talia's shield. I need to stay away from him. On our team, we had Beckendorf and two other Hephaestus guys, a few from the Ares cabin. Though it still seemed strange that Clarice wasn't around, the Stoll brothers and Nico from Hermes cabin, and a few Aphrodite kids. It was weird that the Aphrodite cabin wanted to play. Usually they sat on the sidelines, chatted, and checked their reflection in the river and stuff but when they heard we were fighting the hunters, they were raring to go. I'll show them, love is worthless, Selena Beauregard grumbled as she strapped on her armor. I'll pulverize them. The other girls of the Aphrodite clan were looking at Naruto while blushing and giggling, but they were still ready for battle. That left Talia and me. I'll take the offense, Talia volunteered, you take defense. Oh, I hesitated, because I'd been about to say the exact same thing, only reserved. Don't you think with your shield and all, you'd be better defense? Talia already had Aegis on her arm, and even our own teammates were giving her a wide berth, trying not to cower before the bronze head of Medusa. Well, I was thinking it would make better offense, Talia said. Besides, you've had more practice at defense. I wasn't sure if she was teasing me. I'd had some pretty bad experiences with defense on Capture the Flag. My first year, Annabeth had put me out as a kind of bait and I'd almost been gored to death with spears and killed by a hellhound. Yeah, no problem, I lied. Cool. Talia turned to help some of the Aphrodite kids, who were having trouble suiting up their armor without breaking their nails. Nico D'Angelo ran up to me with a big grin on his face. Percy, this is awesome. His blue feathered bronze helmet was falling in his eyes, and his plate was about six sizes too big. I wondered if there was any way I'd looked that ridiculous when I'd first arrived. Unfortunately, I probably had. Nico lifted his sword with effort. Do we get to kill the other team? Well, no, but the hunters are immortal, right? That's only if they don't fall in battle, besides. It would be awesome if we just, like, resurrected as soon as we were killed, so we could keep fighting, and. Nico, this is serious. Real swords, these can hurt. He stared at me, a little disappointed, 
and I realized that I just sounded like my mother. Whoa. Not a good sign. I patted Nico on the shoulder. Hey, it's cool. Just follow the team. Stay out of Zoe's way. If you even see Naruto, just run. We'll have a blast. Chiron's hoof thundered on the pavilion floor. Heroes, he called. You know the rules, the creek is the boundary line. Blue team, Camp Half Blood, shall take the West Woods. Hunters of Artemis, Red team, shall take the East Woods. I will serve as refereed and battlefield medic. No intentional maiming, please. All magical items are allowed, Naruto, no jutsu of any kind. Naruto groaned. I wonder what jutsu are, to your positions. Sweet, Nico whispered next to me. What kind of magic items, do I get one? I was about to break it to him that he didn't, when Talia said, Blue team, follow me. They cheered and followed. I had to run to catch up, and tripped over somebody's shield, so I didn't look much like a co-captain, more like an idiot. Naruto's pav we headed off to our positions and Zoe started talking strategy. I tuned out most of it until she said, I'll be going in at taking their flag. Tis not guarded well. Whoa. I think I should go in and take the flag. You should stay here and guard their flag. I'm faster and stronger than you, I said. Zoe blushed in embarrassment. She looked around to see that the hunters nodded in agreement. There was no hiding the fact that I was better than her. She sighed and nodded. I gave a very big grin. She went on with giving off her plan with me being the person to get the flag. I chuckled lightly. This was going to be fun. Percy's pav, we set our flag at the top of Zeus's fist. It was a good place to set the flag. The top boulder was 20 feet tall and really hard to climb, so the flag was clearly visible, like the rules said it had to be, and it didn't matter that the guards weren't allowed to stand within 10 yards of it. I set Nico on guard duty with Beckendorf and the Stoll brothers, figuring he'd be safely out of the way. Talia gave us a pretty good plan, but didn't want us to leave our posts. I tried to say that if there was an opportunity to get the flag, go for it. She didn't agree, so I just dropped it. Now, is everybody clear? She asked. Everybody nodded. We broke into our smaller groups. The horn sounded and the game began. Selena's group disappeared into the woods on the left. Talia's group gave it a few seconds, and then darted off toward the right. Naruto's pav I ran off into the woods on the blue team's left and jumped on the trees trying to get to Percy's flag. I got there pretty fast. I saw Percy and a few others guarding the flag. He seemed to be contemplating whether or not to go to get our flag. I smirked, just what I was hoping for. Then he ran off with the other kids cheering him, I chuckled, so naive. I jumped off the tree I was on and went over to their flag. They all gasped when they saw me. They were wondering whether they fight back or just give me the flag, they chose the first choice. Beckendorf was the first to come at me he swung horizontally at me. I blocked with my massive sword. It felt weightless in my hands, but in truth it was at least 60 pounds of pure celestial bronze. I whacked him in the head with the pommel of my sword then kicked him out of my way with a roundhouse kick. The Stoll brothers charged at me, shouting. One of them swung at me vertically and I sidestepped and punched him in the face, but not too hard. I raised my sword for an overhead strike and he brought his shield up. I slammed my sword into his shield with enough force to know him down. The Stoll brothers both came back up to fight me. I strapped the decapitating carving knife to my back. I grabbed the concealed tonfas that I sealed on my wrists. The beating commenced. After I finished up on the Stoll brothers, I jumped up to the rock with their flag and jumped back off. I started running toward the creek when I saw Percy running with our flag. He seemed to have noticed someone running behind me. I took a quick look and saw Beckendorf and Nico. He then noticed me and what was in my hand. He shouted, no, and ran faster. He was two feet from the river when I bolted to my side, and I slammed into Percy for the fun of it. The hunters cheered as both sides converged on the creek. Chiron appeared out of the woods, looking grim. The hunters win. Chiron announced without pleasure, then he muttered, for the 56th time in a row. Talia was storming over to Percy. Great, I am going to have to stop this before it gets ugly. Percy's pav. Perseus Jackson. Talia yelled, storming towards me. She smelled like rotten eggs, and she was so mad that blue sparks flickered on her armor. Everybody cringed and backed up because to Aegis, except Naruto for some reason. It took all my willpower not to cower. 
What in the name of the gods were you thinking? She bellowed. I balled my fists. I'd had enough bad stuff happen to me for one day. I didn't need this. I got the flag, Talia. I shook it in her face. I saw the chance and I took it. I was at their base. Talia yelled. But the flag was gone. If you hadn't butted and we would have won. Well actually, most likely not. I had your guy's flag. I doubt you could have gotten to your side before I got to our side, Naruto said. Talia glared at him, telling him to shut up. You had too many on you. Oh, so it's my fault? I didn't say that. Arg? Talia pushed me, and a shock went through my body that blew me backward ten feet into the water. Some of the campers gasped. A couple of the hunters stifled laughs. Sorry, Talia said, turning pale. I didn't mean to. Anger roared in my ears. A wave erupted from the creek, blasting into Talia's face and dousing her from head to toe. I stood up. Yeah, I growled. I didn't mean to, either. Talia was breathing heavily. Enough, Chiron ordered. But Talia held out her spear. You want some, seaweed brain? Somehow, it was okay when Annabeth called me that, at least, I'd gotten used to it, but hearing it from Talia wasn't cool. Bring it on Pinecone face. I raised Riptide, but before I could even defend myself, Talia yelled, and a blast of lightning came down from the sky, hit her spear like a lightning rod and almost slammed into my chest. Naruto came out of nowhere and blocked her spear with his sword. It had a faint blue outline to it and it was like a razor. I was surprised that it had stopped her spear at all. Talia. Naruto said calmly. That is enough. I got to my feet and willed the entire creek to rise. It swirled up, hundred of gallons of water in a massive icy funnel cloud. Percy. Chiron pleaded. Before I was going to throw it at Talia, Naruto whispered something that sounded like, wind style. Drilling air bullet. A ball of compressed air, the size of a basketball, hit the water and it splashed back into the river. I wasn't paying too much attention to it though. My concentration was on something in the woods. Everyone looked at what I was looking at. Someone, something was approaching. It was shrouded in a murky green mist, but as it got close, the campers and hunters gasped. This is impossible, Chiron said. I'd never heard him sound so nervous. It, she has never left the attic, never. And yet, the withered mummy that held the oracle shuffled forward until she stood in the center of the group. Mist curled around our feet, turning the snow a sickly shade of green. None of us dared move. Then her voice hissed inside my head. Apparently everyone could hear it because several clutched their hands over their ears. I am the spirit of Delphi, the voice said. Speaker of the prophecies of Phoebus Apollo, slayer of the mighty Python. The oracle regarded me with its cold, dead eyes. Then she turned unmistakably toward Zoe Nightshade. Approach, seeker, and ask. Zoe swallowed. What must I do to help my goddess? The oracle's mouth opened, and green mist poured out, I saw the vague image of a mountain and a girl standing at the barren peak. It was Artemis, but she was wrapped in chains, fettered to the rocks. She was kneeling, her hands rose as if to fend of an attacker, and it looked like she was in pain. The oracle spoke. Six shall go west to the goddess in chains, one shall be lost in the land without rain. The bane of Olympus shows the trail, campers and hunters combine prevail. The titan's curse must one withstand, and two shall perish by a parent's hand. Then, as we were watching, the mist swirled and retreated like a great green serpent into the mummy's moth. The oracle sat down on a rock and became as still as she, been in the attic, as if she might sit by this creek for a hundred years. Well, isn't she just a ball of sunshine? Naruto tried to joke. Key word, tried. The least the oracle could have done was walk back to the attic by herself. Instead, Percy and I were elected to carry her. Grover was picked too though Talia elected me also. I was pretty confused on why though, still am. Watch her head. Grover warned as we went up the stairs, it was too late. Bonk. Percy whacked her mummified face against the trapdoor frame and dust flew. I tried to keep from laughing, but it was very hard not to. Ah, man. We set her down and checked for damage. Did I break anything? Percy asked. I can't tell. Grover agreed. I doubt it, though, anything's possible, I said. We hauled her up and set her on her tripod stool, with Percy huffing and sweating. Peefed, lightweight. 
I could tell Percy was happy to leave because he all but sprinted out of the attic. Grover was close behind, while I just took my time. I shut the door on my way out and saw Grover and Percy waiting for me. Well, Grover said, that was gross. I laughed at that. I knew he was trying to keep things light for Percy's sake, but for some reason I couldn't stop myself from laughing. Which earned me stares that said what the beep is wrong with you. Anyways, the whole camp was mad at Percy for losing the game to the hunters, and then there was the new prophecy from the oracle. It was like the spirit of Delphi had gone out of her way to exclude Percy, which is sad. She'd ignored his question and walked half a mile to talk to Zoe, and not me. Artemis is my mom, I wanted the quest. What will Chiron do? Percy asked Grover. I don't know, I want to be out there though, he replied. Searching for Pan? I asked Grover. Grover smiled and nodded. I could tell that Percy completely forgot about Grover's life ambition. Finding Pan. I have a feeling in my gut that he would, but so many have failed in trying to find Pan. I would hate it if Grover's search was for nothing. I've let the trail go cold, he said. I feel restless, like I'm missing something really important. He's out there somewhere. I can just feel it. Percy was about to say something but hesitated, I guess he couldn't think of what to say either. Before we could say anything, Talia tromped up the stairs. She was officially not talking to Percy now, but she looked at Grover and said, Tell Percy to get his butt downstairs. Why? Percy asked. Did he say something? Talia asked Grover. Um, he asked why. Dionysus is calling a council of cabin leaders to discuss the prophecy, she said. Unfortunately, that includes Percy. You too, Naruto, she said. Yes ma'am. I said meekly. I followed her down the stairs, but not before I heard the snickers of Percy and Grover. He is so whipped, Percy said. I hung my head in defeat, I am, whipped. Percy's paw of the council was help around a ping pong table in the rec room. Dionysus waved his hand and supplied snacks, cheese whiz, crackers, and several bottles of red wine. Then Chiron reminded him that wine was against his restrictions and most of us were underage. Mr. D sighed. With a snap of his fingers the wine turned to Diet Coke. Nobody drank that either. Mr. D and Chiron, in wheelchair form, sat at one end of the table. Naruto, Zoe and Bianca D'Angelo, who had kind of become Zoe's personal assistant, took the other end. Talia and Grover and I sat along the right, and the other head counselors, Beckendorf, Selina Beauregard, and the Stoll brothers, sat on the left. The Aries kids were supposed to send a representative, too, but all of them had gotten broken limbs, accidentally, during capture the flag, courtesy of the hunters. They were resting up in the infirmary. Zoe started the meeting off on a positive note, this is pointless. Grover went off and started scooping up crackers and ping pong balls and spraying them with topping. There is no time for talk, Zoe continued. Our goddess needs us, the hunters must leave immediately. And go where? Chiron asked. West, Bianca said, she had changed so much since last time. You heard the prophecy. Five shall go west to the goddess in chains, we can get five hunters and free her. Yes, Zoe agreed. Artemis is being held hostage, we must find her and free her. It's nice to know that you're thinking ahead sweetheart, but you need to remember, campers and hunters combined prevail. If you ever want to get my mother then we all need to work together, Naruto replied off-handedly. Zoe flushed in embarrassment. Naruto always seemed to know what to say at the right times, sometimes I wished I was more like him. No, Zoe shouted, the hunters do need thy help. It's your now Zoe, we don't say thy anymore, not in a couple hundreds of years, Naruto said. Zoe hesitated, like she was trying to form the word correctly, yeah, we do not need yeah help. Naruto sighed, well, it's a start. I fear the prophecy says you do need our help, Chiron said. Campers and hunters must cooperate. Or do they? Mr. D mused, swirling his diet coke under his nose like it had a fine bouquet. One shall be lost. Two shall perish. That sounds rather nasty, doesn't it? What if you fail because you try to cooperate? Mr. D, Chiron sighed, with all due respect, whose side are you on? Dionysus raised his eyebrows. Sorry, my dear centaur, just trying to be helpful. We're supposed to work together, Talia said stubbornly. I don't like it either, Zoe, but you know prophecies. 
you want to fight against one? Zoe grimaced, but I could tell Talia had scored a point. We must not delay, Chiron warned. Today is Sunday. This very Friday, December 21st, is the winter solstice. Oh, joy, Dionysus muttered. Another dull annual meeting. Artemis must be present at the solstice, Zoe said. She has been one of the most vocal on the council arguing for action against Kronos's minions. If she is absent, the gods will decide nothing. We will lose another year of war preparations. Are you suggesting that the gods have trouble acting together, young lady? Dionysus asked. Yes, Lord Dionysus. Mr. D nodded. Just checking. You're right, of course. Carry on. I must agree with Zoe, said Chiron. Artemis's presence at the Winter Council is critical. We have only a week to find her. And possibly even more important, to locate the monster she was hunting. Now, we must decide who goes on this quest. Three and three, I said. Everybody looked at me. Talia even forgot to ignore me. We're supposed to have six, I said, feeling self conscious. Three hunters, three from Camp Half Blood. That's more than fair. Talia and Zoe exchanged looks, well, Talia said, it does make sense. Zoe grunted. I would prefer to take all the hunters, we will need strength of numbers. Chiron then went on about how having too many hunters would spoil the scent, or something like that. He also talked about part of the prophecy, the bane of Olympus shows the trail. This monster, the bane of Olympus. I have hunted at Lady Artemis's side for many years, yet I have no idea what this beast might be. Everybody looked at Dionysus, I guess because he was the only god present and gods are supposed to know things. He was flipping through a wine magazine, but when everyone got silent he glanced up. Well, don't look at me. I'm a young god, remember? I don't keep track of all those ancient monsters and dusty titans. They make for terrible party conversation. Chiron, I said, you don't have any ideas about the monster? Chiron pursed his lips. I have several ideas, none of them good. Before he got any farther, Naruto cut him off. I know what you were implying, Chiron. Frankly, I'd suggest not telling anyone. It'll only frighten everyone. Anyway, the monsters you were going to say is definitely not the ones. Poseidon would have already sounded the alarm, Naruto said. Chiron nodded. That's some serious danger you're facing, Connor Stoll said. I liked how he said you not we. It sounds like half of the six are going to die. One shall be lost in the land without rain, Beckendorf said. If I were you, I'd stay out of the desert, and the Titan's curse must one withstand, Selina said. What could that mean? I saw Chiron and Zoe exchange a nervous look, but whatever they were thinking, they didn't share it. Two shall perish by a parent's hand, Grover said in between bites of cheese whiz and ping pong balls. How is that possible? Whose parent would kill them? There was a heavy silence around the table. I glanced at Talia and wondered if she was thinking the same thing I was. We were thinking that our parents were going to kill us. I remembered a conversation I'd had last year with Annabeth. I'd asked her, if I was so potentially dangerous, why the gods didn't just kill me. Some of the gods would like to kill you, she'd said, but they're afraid of offending Poseidon. Could an Olympian parent turn against his half-blood child? Would it sometimes be easier just to let them die? If there were ever any half bloods who needed to worry about that, it was Talia and me. I wondered if maybe I should have sent Poseidon that seashell pattern tie for Father's Day after all. Then I looked at Naruto and saw he was seemingly uncaring. If I were him, I would be scared. Artemis was the sworn virgin goddess. It could be possible that she could kill him. I didn't dwell on that thought for long. There will be deaths, Chiron decided, that much we know. Percy is right, Selena Beauregard said. Three campers should go. Oh, I see, Zoe said sarcastically, and I suppose you wish to volunteer? Selena blushed. I'm not going anywhere with the hunters. Zoe stood. I shall go, of course, and I will take Phoebe, she is our best tracker. The big girl who likes to hit people on the head, Travis Stoll asked cautiously. Zoe nodded, the one who put the arrows in my helmet, Connor added. Yes, Zoe snapped. Why? Oh, nothing, Travis said. Just that we have a t shirt for her from the camp store. He held up a big silver t shirt that said Artemis the Moon Goddess, Fall Hunting Tour 2002, with a huge list of national parks and stuff underneath. It's a collector's item. 
She was admiring it. You want to give it to her? She sighed and took the t-shirt. As I was saying, I will take Phoebe, and I wish Bianca to go. Bianca looked stunned. Me? But, I'm so new, I wouldn't be any good. You will do fine, Zoe insisted. There is no better way to prove thyself. Bianca closed her mouth. I felt kind of sorry for her. I remembered my first quest when I was 12. I had felt totally unprepared. A little honored, maybe, but a lot resentful and plenty scared. I figured the same things were running around in Bianca's head right now. And for the campers? Chiron asked. His eyes met mine, but I couldn't tell what he was thinking. Me? Grover stood up so fast he bumped the ping pong table. He brushed cracker crumbs and ping pong ball scraps off his lap. Anything to help Artemis. Zoe wrinkled her nose. I think not, Seder. You are not even a half blood. But he is a camper, Talia said. And he's got a Seder's senses and woodland magic. Can you play a tracker song yet, Grover? Absolutely. Zoe wavered. I didn't know what a tracker song was, but apparently Zoe thought it was a good thing. Very well, Zoe said. And the second camper? I'll go. Talia stood and looked around, daring anyone to question her. She faltered when she looked at one person. Chiron. He had an odd look in his eyes, it looked like, disappointment. She seemed to regain her composure before anyone could notice. Though I knew she was thinking the same thing as me. What's wrong with Chiron? And what of the third camper? Zoe asked impatiently. I want to go. I said. Talia said nothing. Chiron was still studying me, his eyes sad. It should be Naruto, Artemis is his mother, Zoe said. Everyone was quiet. I looked around at Talia and Grover and saw that they both had realized our mistakes. We all had shot off and joined the quest when Naruto should have been the first one on the quest. We all selfishly wanted to be on the quest. Now I understood why Chiron looked disappointed. He thought we would suggest Naruto be on the quest. Oh, Grover said, aware of the problem. Whoa, yeah, I forgot, Naruto has to go. I didn't mean, I'll stay. Percy and Naruto should go in my place. He cannot, Zoe said, referring to me. He is a boy. I won't have hunters traveling with a boy. You traveled here with me, and what about Naruto? He's a boy also, I reminded her. That was a short-term emergency, and it was ordered by the goddess. I will not go across country and fight dangers in the company of a boy. And in technical terms, Naruto is a man, and Artemis's son, he has to go. What about Grover? I demanded. Zoe shook her head, he does not count, he's a satyr, he is not technically a boy. Hey, Grover protested. I have to go, I said, I need to be on this quest. Why? Zoe asked, because of thy friend Annabeth. I felt myself blushing. I hated that everyone was looking at me. No, I mean, partly. I just feel like I'm supposed to go. Nobody rose to my defense. Mr. D looked bored, still reading his magazine. Selena, the Stoll brothers, and Beckendorf were staring at the table. Bianca gave me a look of pity. No, Zoe said flatly. I insist upon this. I will take a satyr if I must and Naruto, but not you. Naruto sighed. He hadn't spoken in a while. We all looked at him expectantly, even Mr. D rose his eyes from his magazine a bit to see what would unfold. Zoe, no offense, but I am basically the head of the Artemis cabin since I am her son. I also have authority over you and the hunters by the word of my mother from a few years ago. So I say, you will go with Bianca, Phoebe, Talia, Grover, and Percy and that is final. Naruto said seriously, he gave Grover, Talia, and I a kind smile. Everyone gasped. Even Mr. D was pretty surprised, considering how his eyebrows rose up. Zoe was flustered and started stammering, all the while Naruto was looking completely calm. But but, Naruto, I can handle having a satyr along and you, but not him, Zoe shouted. I know you don't want to have him along with you, Zoe, but I mean it, he is going with you and that is final. Naruto finished. Zoe was flustered with anger but nodded nonetheless. Then what about you? Don't you want to come and help your mother? She asked. I am, Naruto said, smiling cheekily. We all stared at him like he was crazy. I am pretty sure he is crazy. Naruto, Talia said slowly. You just said you're not going on the quest. How are you going to help find your mother? When you are not going on the quest? 
she shouted the last part. Oh yeah, that's right, Naruto said happily. Yup, it's official, he is crazy. But, I was given a quest by a god recently. I am to take an apprentice, to be specific. The gods, goddess's child is an apprentice. I am not allowed to give the name of the god, goddess or their gender. Naruto said. Nobody said anything. Everyone knew how powerful he is. Anybody who would be his apprentice would be, no doubt, strong. Anyways, let's get back to the subject at hand. The quest is for Artemis. So Naruto should choose who can go and search for his mother. I sat there as Chiron concluded the council. I still felt guilty that I took Naruto's place on this quest. Even though he had a quest from another god, goddess, he still should be going. So be it, Chiron said. Talia, Grover, and Percy will accompany Zoe, Bianca, and Phoebe. You shall leave at first light. And may the gods, he glanced at Dionysus, present company included, we hope, be with you. I didn't go to dinner that night, which was a mistake, go figure, because Chiron, Grover, and Percy went looking for me. Naruto, I'm so sorry, Grover said, sitting next to me on the bunk. I didn't know they'd, that you'd, honest. He started to sniffle, and I knew that if I didn't cheer him up he's either start sobbing or chewing my mattress. He tends to eat household objects, including furniture, whenever he gets upset. Personally, I enjoy sleeping on a mattress. It's okay, Grover, I said honestly. Really, it's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry too, Naruto. I just really wanted to get Annabeth and Percy started off. Like I said to Grover, Percy, it's okay. I don't mind at all. I said, smiling at him. Grover's lower lip trembled. I wasn't even thinking, I was so focused on helping Artemis. I just really, really wanted to help out. I nodded. I knew that Grover was, like, in love with my mom and Percy was in love with Annabeth. He didn't know that yet, though, and he wanted to find her. Grover, Percy, Chiron said, perhaps you'd let me have a word with Naruto? Sure, Grover sniffled. Okay, Percy said. Chiron waited. I wonder when they'll realize he meant alone. Oh, Grover said. You mean alone, sure, Chiron. He looked at me miserably. See? Nobody needs a goat. I just smiled at him sadly and shook my head. He has such a low self-esteem. He trotted out the door, blowing his nose on his sleeve. Percy followed Grover on his way out. Chiron sighed and knelt on his horse legs. Naruto, I really wish you would go along on this quest. Why? I asked. I wasn't too sure on why he would want me to go, other than the reason that Artemis is my mother. Well, Chiron said. He stood straight up again. I want you to go, mostly, because you are the strongest at the camp. Except for Dionysus, of course. I would feel much better if you would go along and protect Talia and Percy, he stated. I told you guys before, I am going to help them, and it will be like a side quest along with my main one, I said happily. Chiron frowned and looked at me intently. What is your quest, Naruto? You never told us what it really was. I sighed and got up from my bunk. I paced along the cabin a bit then stopped and looked at Chiron. My quest isn't an easy one. They made me go in front of all of them, and that means all of the major Olympian gods. The gods feel that I have become strong, like really strong. If I die, they want me to have an apprentice so that they would always have a champion that would be strong. I paused and let what I said sink in. They wanted my apprentice to be strong like me, but not know my jutsu. They said it makes me too close to godlike. They let me keep my chakra and jutsu because they know that I am loyal to them. So they told me to get an apprentice in him, her come with me on every quest one take. They gave me an ongoing mission. To rescue them if they ever need it. They said if an oracle was to ever give a prophecy on how many people would be going on the quest, and I would be going, my apprentice would not affect the number. I said. Realization dawned on Chiron and he smiled. So as you can see, there is how I get myself into the quest. Now, the problem is that one person needs to be taken out of the mission. That will happen tonight, how that happens, you'll find out later. Now to tell you who my apprentice is well. Percy's pov I don't remember falling asleep, but I remember the dream. I was back in that barren cave, the ceiling heavy and low above me. Annabeth was kneeling under the weight of a dark mass that looked like a pile of boulders. She was too tired to even cry out. Her legs trembled. Any second, I knew she would run out of strength and the cavern ceiling would collapse on top of her. 
How is our mortal guest? A male voice boomed. It wasn't Kronos. Kronos's voice was raspy and metallic, like a knife scraped across stone. I'd heard it taunting me many times before in my dreams. But this voice was much deeper and lower, like a bass guitar. Its force made the ground vibrate. Luke emerged from the shadows. He ran to Annabeth, knelt beside her, and then looked back at the unseen man. She's fading. We must hurry. The hypocrite. Like he really cared what happened to her. The deep voice chuckled. It belonged to someone in the shadows, at the edge of my dream. Then a meaty hand thrust someone forward into the light. Artemis, her hands and feet bound in celestial bronze chains. I gasped. Her silvery dress was torn and tattered. Her face and arms were cut in several places, and she was bleeding ichor, the golden blood of the gods. Her eyes were still that silvery color. Though, from what Naruto said, her eyes were glazed over and she was being controlled. Maybe his dream was telling him that something similar would happen in the future. You heard the boy, said the man in the shadows, decide, Artemis's eyes flashed with anger. I didn't know why she just didn't will the chains to burst, or make herself disappear, but she didn't seem able to. Maybe the chains prevented her, or some magic about this dark, horrible place. The goddess looked at Annabeth and her expression changed to concern and outrage. How dare you torture a maiden like this? She will die soon, Luke said. You can save her. Annabeth made a weak sound of protest. My heart felt like it was being twisted into a knot. I wanted to run to her, but I couldn't move. Free my hands, Artemis said. Luke brought out his sword, backbiter. With one strike, he broke the goddess's handcuffs. Artemis ran to Annabeth and took the burden from her shoulders. Annabeth collapsed on the ground and lay there shivering. Artemis staggered trying to support the weight of the black rocks. The man in the shadows chuckled. You are as predictable as you are easy to beat, Artemis. You surprised me, the goddess said, straining under her burden, it will not happen again. Indeed it will not, the man said. Now you are out of the way for good, I knew you could not resist helping a young maiden. That is, after all, your specialty, my dear. Artemis groaned. You know nothing of mercy, you swine. On that, the man said, we can agree. Luke, you may kill the girl now. No, Artemis shouted. Luke hesitated. She, she may yet be useful, sir, further bait. Bah! You truly believe that? Yes, General, they will come for her, I'm sure. The man considered. Then the Drasenai can guard her here. Assuming she does not die from her injuries, you may keep her alive until winter solstice. After that, if our sacrifice goes as planned, her life will be meaningless. Luke gathered up Annabeth's listless body and carried her away from the goddess. You will never find the monster you seek, Artemis said. Your plan will ail. How little you know, my young goddess, the man in the shadows said. Even now, your darling attendants being their quest to find you. They shall play directly into my hands. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have a long journey to make. We must greet your hunters and make sure their quest is challenging. The man started laughing, it echoed around in the darkness, shaking the ground until it seemed the whole cavern ceiling would collapse. My son, Naruto. He will stop you, she shouted. He immediately stopped laughing. Apparently, he had heard of Naruto. Ah, yes. You son will definitely prove to be a thorn in my side, though I doubt he would be able to defeat me, he said seriously. Artemis smirked, don't think that, he is much more powerful than you think. The man's tone became very angry. Just wait, my young goddess. When I defeat him, I will kill him slowly, right in front of you, while you can do nothing. That will never happen, my son and his companions will defeat you, her tone almost sounded desperate. The man laughed again and the dream dissolved. I woke up early in the morning. I noticed that some of the hunters were still asleep, while some were up and about. I also had noticed that Zoe and Bianca had left. I checked what time it was, it was 5 am I went out in search of Zoe, just to check if she was ready for her quest. When I left, I saw that Phoebe was in her bed with hives. The shirt that the Stoll brothers gave her was sprayed with centaur blood, which is like acid. Now there is an empty spot for the quest. I saw Zoe and Bianca talking at one of the dining tables. Nearby, I saw that Nico was hiding behind a Greek column. I sensed someone else nearby him, though I didn't see him. It was most likely Percy, 
wearing Annabeth's hat. Percy is way too curious for his own good. As I got closer, I could hear Zoe and Bianca talking. I hid behind a Greek column that was close to me. I should have just went out to talk to them, but I decided against it. But the prophecy, Bianca said. If Phoebe can't go, we only have five, we'll have to pick another. There is not time, Zoe said. We must leave at first light. That's immediately. Besides, the prophecy said we would lose one. In the land without rain, Bianca said, but that can't be here. It might be, Zoe said, though she didn't sound convinced. The camp has magic borders. Nothing, not even weather, is allowed in without permission. It could be a land without rain. But, Bianca, hear me. Zoe's voice was strained. I, I can't explain, but I have a sense that we should not pick someone else. It would be too dangerous. They would meet an end worse than Phoebe's. I don't want to risk another hunter. Bianca was silent. You should tell Talia the rest of your dream. No it would not help, but if your suspicions are correct, about the general. I have thy word not to talk about that, Zoe said. She sounded really anguished. We will find out soon enough. Now come. Dawn is breaking. Nico scooted out of their way, though, Percy wasn't fast enough. As the girls sprinted down the steps, Zoe almost ran into something. My guess is Percy. She froze, her eyes narrowing. Her hand crept toward her bow, but the Bianca said, The lights of the big house are on, hurry. And Zoe followed her out of the pavilion. Percy followed, after letting her get ahead of him a bit. I could tell that Nico was thinking about running after his sister. He took a deep breath and was about to take off, but I said, Wait. He almost slipped on the icy steps as he spun around to find me. Where did you come from? I've been here the whole time. I am a ninja, he mouthed the word ninja. Wow, cool. How did you know that Zoe and your sister were here? He blushed. I heard them walk by the Hermes cabin. I don't, I don't sleep too well at camp. So I heard footsteps and whispering. And so I kind of followed. I grinned. Now you are thinking of following them on the quest? How did you know that? Because it's quite obvious, you can't go though, I said. He looked defiant. Because I'm too young. They won't let you. They'll catch you and send you back here. In my book though, you aren't too young, but to them you would be. There will be very strong monsters. Some of the heroes will die. His shoulders sagged. He shifted from one foot to another. Maybe you're right, but, but you can go for me. Say what? Don't you want to go too? I asked, completely perplexed. I would like to go, but I'd only get us caught, he said. I frowned. Are you sure you don't want to go with me? It would be no hassle. He smiled, I'm sure, you were planning to go anyway. I smiled. Yeah, I said, I really want to help my mom, even if I didn't I would have to. I won't tell on you, he said, but you have to promise to keep my sister safe. That's a big promise, Nico, on a trip like this, it won't be easy. Promise, he insisted, I'll do my best, that's all I can promise right now. Get going, then, he said. Good luck, I nodded. Though, this was a bit crazy. I had nothing but my sword and the clothes I was wearing. Tell Chiron. I'll make something up. Nico smiled crookedly. I'm good at that, go on. I ran as fast as I could to get to the top of Half Blood Hill. I got there in time to see the camp's van disappearing down the farm road, probably Argus taking the quest group into the city. After that, they would be on their own. I slapped my forehead. How was I supposed to keep up with them? Running. That was out of the option, it would look weird to see a teenager chasing a van through the streets. Then I thought of something. When I first met my mother, she gave me a gift, an animal ride. I only was able to get to know him for a bit, but we bonded instantly. Before my untimely death, my first death in America, I sent him to wait for me here and to tell Chiron to look after him. He should be in the stables. I ran to the stables, without anyone seeing me. When I got there, there was a multitude of horses whinnying. I looked around for my ride, and then I saw him. It was Stanley, the stag, the flying and talking stag. Since stags are sacred to my mother, she gave him to me as a gift. I went up to him and he noticed me immediately, he was resting near a stack of hay. Hey, Stanley, do you remember me? I said. His head rose up to look at me, he rose up completely. He was about five feet tall and five feet long. He was large, for a stag. 
When I first met him he said that reindeer are actually caribou. From what I learned. Stags are deer, and a caribou's is a large deer. So, I guess, in a way, the caribou are also sacred to my mother. I remember you, aren't you my owner, Naruto? He asked. Yeah it's me, I said proudly, I was happy that he remembered me. HN, you still the same idiot, actually, don't answer that. I was not, and still not, an idiot, I shouted. Whatever, what is it you need? You obviously didn't just show up to say, hi, he stated. I'm starting to wonder if we did ever bond, well, yeah. I do need your help, my mom was kidnapped, so I need your help to get me to the rest of the people is on that quest, I said. He didn't say anything for a while, he sighed, I guess I will help you. Thanks, Stanley, I said. He nodded. I opened up the gate of his pen and led him out. I jumped on his back and he looked at me to see if I was ready. I gave him an affirmative nod and he took off with a run. He then took a long leap and we were soon flying. The thing about flying on a stag during the daytime is that it is impossible, but not with Stanley. Though, I had to keep Stanley in the air, mostly because if people saw me riding Stanley, while going through the streets, it would cause worldwide panic. The army would be called out and shoot at me and Stanley. Eventually, one bullet would hit Stanley and we would hurtle back to the ground and crash painfully. They would capture Stanley and breed him like crazy and they would make an army of flying deer. Soon, a very fat man would get eight reindeer. He would name them Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, and Blitzen. He would then become Santa Claus. He would give presents to good kids on Christmas and coal for bad kids. Eventually, the bad kids would kill Santa and his reindeer. The army would then kill all of the reindeer so nobody could become Santa again. And I would be subjected to torture until I would tell them who I was working for. And after I had denied giving them information long enough, they would kill me and everyone I know. Needless to say, we stayed up in the clouds, which were, fortunately, pretty low in the winter. We darted around, trying to keep the white camp half blood van in sight. And if it was cold on the ground, it was seriously cold in the air, with icy rain stinging my skin. We lost the van twice. Stanley blamed me for some reason. He said it was because of my incessant shivering. But I had a pretty good sense that they would go into Manhattan first, so it wasn't too difficult to pick up their trail again. Traffic was bad with the holidays and all. It was mid morning before they got into the city. I landed Stanley near the top of the Chrysler building and watched the White Camp van, thinking it would pull into the bus station, but it just kept driving. Where's Argus taking them? I muttered. HN, Argus isn't driving, Stanley said. That girl is. Which girl? I asked impatiently. The hunter girl, with the silver crown in her hair, Stanley said. Zoe? I asked. Yes, is that? I think it is, it's a donut shop? Let's go and get some, he said excitedly. I tried explaining to him that taking a reindeer to a donut shop would give every cop in there a heart attack and I also told him my theory of what the army would do, but he didn't seem to get it. Meanwhile, the van kept snaking its way toward the Lincoln Tunnel. It had never even occurred to me that Zoe could drive. I mean, she didn't look 16. Then again, she was immortal. I wondered if she had a New York license, and if so, what her birth date said. Well, I said. Let's go after them. Stanley and I leapt off the Chrysler building, and were back in the air. He was going slowly, though. I sighed. Come on, Stanley, I said, trying to sound upbeat. I'll buy you some donuts in New Jersey. He went faster as a way of saying, yes, donuts, I'll get you to New Jersey in no time. Naruto's pav as it turned out, I did buy Stanley some donuts in New Jersey. I even bought some for myself, though, we had to go a lot faster to catch up with them. Zoe drove south like a crazy person, and we were into Maryland before she finally pulled over at a rest stop. Stanley nearly tumbled out of the sky, he was so tired. I'll be okay, Naruto, he panted just catching my breath stay here i told him i'm going to scout stay here i can do that i walked over to the convenience store i didn't have to sneak in but i had to be sure not to attract any attention i thought i'd go inside and warm up maybe get a cup of hot chocolate or something i had a lot of money in my pocket i could gulp it all down but i'd burn myself so i decided against getting anything though i was thinking about buying something to eat but my whole plan was ruined by Zoe, Talia, Bianca, 
Percy, and Grover all coming out of the store. Grover, are you sure? Percy was saying. Well, pretty sure. 99%. Okay, 85%. And you did this with acorns? Bianca asked, like she couldn't believe it. Grover looked offended. It's a time honored tracking spell. I mean, I'm pretty sure I did it right. Shouldn't you be completely sure? Percy asked. DC is about 60 miles from here, Bianca said. Nico and I, she frowned. We used to live there. That's, that's strange, I'd forgotten. I dislike this, Zoe said. We should go west, the prophecy said west. Oh, like your tracking skills are better, Talia growled. Zoe stepped toward her. You challenge my skills, you scullion? You know nothing of being a hunter? Oh, scullion, you're calling me a scullion? What the heck is a scullion? Whoa, you too, Grover said nervously. Come on, not again, Grover's right. Percy said. DC is our best bet. Bianca said. Zoe didn't look convinced, but she nodded reluctantly. Very well. Let us keep moving. You're going to get us arrested, driving, Talia grumbled. I look closer to 16 than you owe. Perhaps, Zoe snapped. But I have been driving since automobiles were invented. Let us go. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.